Good evening to everyone on the East Coast and good morning slash afternoon for everyone else dialing in from other time zones. My name is Hannah Kang and I'm very honored to be serving as the founder and co-chair for the KCS Associate Board. We are the organizers and hosts of tonight's event, Amplifying Black and Korean Voices. And we are so pleased that you can all join us tonight for this very important discussion. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to quickly go over a few housekeeping items. During the 30 minute discussion with Marja and Milton, please feel free to type in your questions in the chat box at any time. Board members will be sorting through them throughout the discussion and there will be a 10 minute Q&A following the discussion based on your submitted questions. Um, please also stick around for the end of the Q&A as we will be sharing some exciting opportunities with our sponsors, which will only be made available for our attendees. And lastly, we strongly advise that you set your viewer settings to speaker view throughout the events. So a quick introduction to the Associate Board. We are a group of young professionals whose mission is to support and raise awareness for our parent organization, Korean Community Services of Metropolitan New York. We do this through events like tonight's discussion as a way to meaningfully address the issues that are important to our community and are also the focus of many of KCS's programs and services. KCS was founded in 1973 and has since then become one of the largest and oldest operating Korean nonprofits in the Northeast currently servicing over a thousand individuals every day in the areas of senior care, mental health, public health, workforce development, and youth empowerment. I'd like to first say on behalf of the Associate Board that we have been truly blown away by the overwhelming interest in tonight's event. We understand that this is a complex issue, but we also feel, and I think tonight is evidence of this, that there is a real need and perhaps even hunger for this kind of dialogue in our community. I think I speak for all the board members when I say that we are really grateful to have had this opportunity to host this discussion, which we feel is also in line with the spirit of the work that KCS does in the Korean community. In light of the violence we saw against Asians during COVID-19 and the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless other names, racism has been a much addressed topic and a grim reality for both the Asian and black communities in the last couple of months. I think it's no secret, however, that the history between the Black and particularly the Korean American community has not exactly been one of collaboration or mutual respect, despite the fact we share a common experience in facing discrimination in this country. Our reason for wanting to have this particular discussion tonight was that we felt it was important to not have a conversation about anti-Blackness and racism that was centered only around ourselves as Korean Americans. In addition, it is important for us to deliberately counteract a common and somewhat unfortunate perception of our community, which is that we can come off as insular and detached from these types of issues, especially when we don't think it directly affects us. If you identify as Korean or Asian or Korean slash Asian American, I'd like to specifically challenge all of us tonight to think about what we can specifically do. How do we take the feelings that we've held the last couple of months, perhaps of confusion, obligation, maybe even guilt, feelings that we may have been culturally trained to internalize and for which we don't have a common vocabulary to discuss, how do we turn them into conscious acts and strategies that are more than just about having conversations with our parents about racism or what it means to be a good or bad Asian? I think we are all capable of doing more than that, of being more introspective, more organized, more vocal, particularly because we know firsthand that silence in the face of bias and discrimination as we've experienced firsthand ourselves during this pandemic is not an option. Hopefully our community will continue to be open to having more of these conversations and to actively participate in the greater work around creating our specific model of allyship with the black community and forming solidarity. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Linda Lee, president and CEO of KCS, who will introduce our moderator. Hi everyone, uh, we're so excited to see so many this tonight um, and we are extremely uh, grateful for all of your interest in this event and I just wanted to first thank the uh, associate board members for putting this together I know they spent countless hours uh, on the back end just trying to organize everything and of course uh, for Milton and Marja we're so excited to hear your stories later um, just really quickly for those that don't know KCS and who we are um, um, I've been now working at the organization for about 10 and a half years and uh, we've been around since 1973 
And our mission has always been to serve the neediest uh, people in our community. And uh, we do that through a whole host of services. Uh, we're the only ones that actually provide Meals on Wheels in New York City to Korean seniors. Um, and the head cook of our uh, senior center for the longest time, who's now a recipient of our meals, uh, she's 93, I think, and was working at KCS for 30 years and she started when she was 60. Um, wow. I, I tell my husband all the time, like, don't, don't expect that of me, because <laughs> that's <laughs> a different generation. But yeah, they, it's like, that's really the spirit and, and grit, I think, of the, the staff and also uh, the folks that are part of this organization. And, you know, we also provide a whole host of other services around workforce, immigration, adult literacy, a lot of the services that um, are really challenging the neediest folks in our community that have language, cultural barriers. Um, and our most recent program, uh, which Hannah mentioned and touched upon, is our mental health clinic. So we're currently the only Korean nonprofit in New York State that actually has our outpatient uh, mental health clinic license. So we can provide individual psychotherapy as well as medication management. And I'm sure we all know that uh, mental health is such an important topic um, in our community right now as well. And I think in general, COVID has just really um, taken, uh, has really challenged, I think, a lot of us in so many ways. And then a few months into COVID, we have, um, you know, the murder of George Floyd, and it brought up all these um, important questions and issues, I think, that we need to ask ourselves and really wrestle with as a community. And um, as Hannah so eloquently said, you know, I think this is the time to amplify our voices, have these very honest conversations, um, and really ask ourselves as a uh, Asian and Korean community, what is our role and how do we support our fellow communities of color and how do we stand together and make sure that um, this doesn't uh, continue, right? And how do we amplify our voices? And so that's why we're here tonight and we're so excited. Um, and I have the uh, extreme pleasure of introducing Sug Young Yoon, who is our amazing, she's one of our amazing board members, um, and she comes from a wealth of background in communications as well as marketing, and she has played such an important role in helping our staff uh, with our communications effort, which became 100 times more important during COVID, and um, she's played such a crucial role in caring for our staff and our community, and so um, I really want to thank you so much, Sug Young, for your willingness to step up in this way. And so I will pass the mic to you. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to Amplifying Voices. Um, it's a new series of conversations about various issues that are of particular interest to Korean Americans and Asian American communities in New York City. So please uh, continue to follow us and continue to join us in future events. Um, my name is S.K. Yoon, and I'm a member of the board at KCS. I'm so excited tonight to be speaking with Marja Bongarichan in Milton, Washington, about issues that have been on many of our minds these past few months. Issues of race, racism, and identity, especially as Korean Americans, Asian Americans, and also exploring the idea of allyship. How can we become better allies and help break the cycle of systemic racism that exists in our society today? But before we begin, let me properly introduce our guests tonight. Marja Vongarichan is an author, chef, and business owner who helped introduce Korean food and culture to a broader American audience through her wonderful PBS series, Kimchi Chronicles. I'm sure many of you remember that series, which featured Marja and her world-famous chef husband, Jean Georges, traveling throughout Korea and doing what Koreans do best, eating, drinking, and even karaoke. Marja's remarkable life story began in Urjangbu, South Korea, where she was born to a Korean mother and an American soldier father. She was adopted at the age of three by a colonel in the U.S. Marine Corps and his wife, a civil rights attorney, and grew up outside of Washington, D.C. With the help of documents provided by her adoptive parents, Marja found her Korean birth mother when she was 19. She was actually living in Brooklyn, of all places. Since then, she has reconnected with her Korean roots, family, culture, and food, and Kimchi Chronicles documented Marja's very personal and joyful journey of rediscovering the tastes and smells of the first food she had ever had, which was Korean food. Welcome, Marja. Hello, everybody. Am, Am I, I muted? Oh, good. 
I mean, you're good. You're there. Okay. And on to Milton Washington. Milton was adopted from South Korea at the age of eight, he thinks, in 1978. Um, Milton now lives in Harlem. He runs a visual development company which helps businesses grow by more effectively telling their stories visually. But in the spirit of old Harlem, he's quite a Renaissance man. He's amassed a large body of work in photography, some of which has been published in the New York Times and Food and Wine magazine. His newest endeavor, though, is a revolutionary fitness system he founded called Rock Mill Fitness in which a series of movements build strength and develop flexibility while providing cardio and conditioning, resulting in help alleviating joint pain and improving coordination, rhythm, and balance. The system is all centered around the African stool, also called the rock. It's a great name. <laughs> but that is not all. Milton is also a wordsmith. His upcoming memoir, Slicky Boy, will be published in 2021. It's the story of a fatherless black boy born to a Korean prostitute left to roam his camp town with a pack of homeless kids. Little Miltona fights, steals, and drinks while his mother works long hours, all until the age of eight when he's adopted from the country that never claimed him by a black military family from Texas, the Washingtons. Slicky Boy is about the love and the loss of one mother and the finding of another, with a lifetime of living in between. Welcome, Milton. Thanks for having me. Um, so I hear that Marja and Milton, you had actually both been at the same orphanage in Korea. Um, I'm not sure if it was at the same time, but you have incredible life stories. Um, and I just wanted you to share uh, your experiences as adoptees, as Korean black adoptees, um, and also just how that has affected your kind of perception and understanding of race in this country today. Um, maybe we can start with Marja and then we can move on or you can. You, you sure, sure, sure. Better. You can probably, you know, talk over each other as well. Yeah, I'm sure that'll happen. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so actually, now that you say those years, Milton, I think you were adopted before I was. So I was adopted in 1979. You were 1978. 78 for me, yep. Yeah. Okay. So we, we just missed each other, but we connected in New York yeah. uh, years, years, years later. And actually we found a whole group of us that were all adopted by the same orphanage. And it was called Father's, Father Keen's Home for Amerasians. So um, right there, it tells you there was a need um, to get these children out of Korea at that time in the 70s. Um, so my mother was unwed, fell in love with a... Um, young gentleman in the military, in the army, and uh, typical story, a war baby, you know, he left when she was pregnant, and she tried her best, but she kept me until she, until I was about three years old, and then I was put into Father Keen's home, and the way I ended up there was actually Father Keen would roam the streets around these military bases looking for mixed children because he knew how horribly they were treated, and I think Milton, weren't they called um, dust in the street? We were called yep. dust yep. in the streets or yep. something like yep. that. I don't dust know of the streets. Yeah. 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 Um, so you can imagine the urgency and need uh, to leave there. So fortunately, I was found. They convinced my mother um, to allow me to be adopted, and my my parents, my father was actually in the Marine Corps. They're just newly married, and he was stationed in Korea for two years. So they had just gotten there, decided they wanted to adopt um, an Amerasian baby, and I ran by at three. So that was kind of the end of that story. But they also ended up uh, adopting my brother, who's not my biological brother, but we share the same adoptive parents. And he was adopted at the age of uh, three days. Yeah. Wow. So I didn't live long in Korea. I think I lived on the military base for about a year. Um, and then they soon took me to the states yeah where i was naturalized yeah, yeah. um so then after that i had a typical well i wouldn't call it typical i had a no. i had a i had a middle class upbringing um in northern virginia and and i you know was raised with memories of being adopted but i it was family business we didn't talk about it and i looked like my family do you know what i mean mm -hmm. um so I always had memories and I always was very, very curious. And I didn't decide to look for my mom until I went to college. 
Um, but prior to that, I always had little, little bits of Korea um, that would pop up in my mind, but always through food. So my father, he would always order these black bean noodles from this Chinese restaurant every Friday night. And I would always have some and I would be like, I love these and they taste amazing. I, I knew the taste from somewhere, but it didn't, you know, it didn't really connect until I met my birth mother and I found out that it was jajangmyeon, which is, you know, noodles with black bean sauce. And that was my favorite food as a baby, which I didn't know until I was much, much older. Um, but anyway, little tidbits like that. They started to sell kimchi and the giant, you know, where I lived and I would buy some just to remember the, the taste, but no memories other than that. Um, I went to predominantly white schools. Uh, I think the biggest minority there was Asians. Um, but I, I didn't claim it, I guess. I didn't look like them. There was just no connection really. Um, but I did, you know, I did experience colorism within even the African American community. Um, always being asked what I am, where you're from, you know, just, you know, all, all the things that kids say to each other. Um, and then I went to college. Um, I hated my first semester, but at that time, I, I just was kind of in a self-discovery being away from home the first time. And um, I decided to take the documents that my parents had kept for me um, on my adoption with me to start looking for her because I didn't want to include my parents. At that time, it just felt like, and I think a lot of adoptees have some kind of inner guilt. I don't know where we get it from, but it's like, you know, we're so thankful and, and um, fortunate to have been adopted. We don't, we wouldn't want to hurt our parents' feelings in any way by seeking something else. And for me, it was just memories and some kind of connection. You know, I, my, my adoptive mother is very much into uh, genealogy. So she had all these records and things of <clears throat> her family history, but it didn't really pertain to me other than in name. And, um, you know, so I always yearned for that. And I was really happy when I found my birth mother um, in Korea, it took me one phone call actually a couple phone calls, um, but really not much time. And then three months later, I had her number and she, it was a Brooklyn number. And I was in Nashville at Fisk University at the time. So um, yeah, that was, that was quite a reunion over the phone. And then uh, another month of just phone calls and then we actually met each other. So um, what a fast forward to, okay, so I, I eventually ended up moving to New York. Um, my mother taught me Korean through the food because I was eating all my memories. Everything she would make for me, I remembered it. And I needed to know what this was inside and out. So she would take me to K-Town, 32nd Street or Flushing when it was good back then. Um, I don't know where it's gone now. But um, she would take me there shopping and she'd say, you love miyok uh, soup, guka soup. This is miyok. She showed me what brand to buy. and everything. So I really learned um, Korean again through cooking. Um, I noticed though, after I got comfortable with, with words and ordering, I would have microaggressions in K-Town. Like I would, I would ask uh, for the menu or I would order something in Korean and, you know, listen in, listen in, what, what, I'd have to repeat it two and three times. Uh, and then they'd repeat what I said it never answered me in Korean and I just felt like so frustrated. It was like, I finally felt a connection and then here we go, you know, reminding me I'm not Korean. Or they'd say, oh, is this your mom? And I'd be like, yeah. And they'd be like, you don't look Korean. I'm like, I mean, what, what do you answer to that? Thanks, I don't know. Um, and I, I think my most painful moment um, was when I actually went to Korea one time and I was with my daughter and my aunt and, um, we were in Hongdae and I needed a pedicure. <laughs> so I went to go get one and I hear the ladies talking and they weren't very welcoming when I walked in, um, but I said, whatever. Um, but I heard them talking and they, I heard them use the term used for black people. That's not a nice term. And I knew that. And then they started laughing and I said, Mookya, you know, so pissed. I was like, what's funny? And, um, you know, I just got up from there. I like threw the money at them and I left and I went back to my aunt in tears. 
Anyway, she went back to that nail salon and as Koreans say, you know, she went crazy up in there. And uh, it just, it, it was, it was really hurtful because I, you know, it's any kind of racism or microaggression is painful um, because I think people who aren't afflicted with the disease of racism really kind of um, have an openness and, and just see energies and, and spirits instead of color and where you're from or what you look like. Yeah. So that just made me, um, you know, it just, it just, I guess it, it gave me a bit of a reality check, but in the same way I had such a sense of um, healing doing Kimchi Chronicles, which was after that. Mm -hmm. And I realized that where I allowed other people to not, to make me feel like I wasn't connected, I realized I came from within myself. Mm -hmm. And what I was missing were the details. Like I would, I would go to, um, you know, temples and things. And my mother speaks Conglish, you know? So the details are kind of lost in translation. So I didn't understand everything all the time. And when I went to Korea, I had so many things that I'd done numerous times, but they're really um, explained in depth because we had experts every bit of the way there. And after that, I was like, what the hell? I've been letting someone else justify my existence and belonging in this culture. And after that, I would get interviews about the show and Korean reporters would always ask me, do you feel more Korean or more black? And I I'd be like, that is the silliest question ever. I'm equally both. I mean, how do you measure that in a percentage in someone? Yeah. You know, when, when, you know, it's about culture and family and all of it, not just your color and what you look like or what you resemble more. Right. So it's been a big growth thing. And, you know, I've talked to my daughter who's now going to be 20 in September and she's in college and you know, she's all over the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, she posts every day. She'll do like clickbait posts. It'll be like a, you know, tutorial on how to do your eyebrows. And then she'll be like, arrest the murderers of Breonna Taylor. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, that is my girl. So I'm so proud of her. And hopefully with this new generation in how connected everyone is, just because, you know, we're all so close visually now, we're able to do that. Um, I think there's going to be less and less. We got to get rid of this old diseased population first, you know, but I have hope in the future. Milton, what about you? Like, do you feel like, um, you like grew up feeling that you were Korean? I mean, you, you were there until you were eight. Well, um, <clears throat> so kind of unlike Marja, um, I have very, very vivid memories of South Korea because um, my mother dropped me off at the orphanage when I was eight, right? So I kind of lived the whole life. And, um, and within that life, um, it was pretty much kind of governed by two things. It was governed by how all of Korea told me that I wasn't Korean and I wasn't any good because I wasn't Korean and particularly because I was black. Um, that was one kind of governing force or, or an environment. And the other governing force, it was... Um, just the overwhelming sense of my mother's love for me, you know, and, and, and to me, um, if you got to go through the first one, it's kind of best to be equipped with the, with the latter, you know, so, um, you know, it's like a little kid can be, uh, a woman can have a child and they're homeless, but if that child knows that, you know, his mother loves them, um, like, you know, not too much else matters, right? So, um, so it was kind of great balance in, in that respect. Um, but, uh, but I, so I had this life. So it's, if someone were to ask me, well, you know, Milton, you know, do you think you're more black or Korean? Um, you know, very, very much like what Marja said to me is, I kind of feel very much right down the middle, right? There's that. Um, um, and almost kind of principally, I think, right down the middle. But also there's a realistic part that goes, you know, this world doesn't see me as Korean. You know what I mean? It, it, like I can go to, I can go to K-Town and, and, you know, we could be having, you know, uh, uh, some, some good food and some drinks and, and, you know, I, I, I tell whoever, uh, whatever um, um, shop owner down there that, yeah, you know, they, they come over to the table and I'm talking and yeah, I'm Korean. 100% of the time, 
they all laugh as if I'm telling a joke. <laughs> you know that was I mean? messed up. It's like, oh, oh y'all, Mil uh, Milton, you're so funny. I'm like, but I'm serious, right? But oh. you know, but 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 the thing is though, um, um, but I nowadays in in kind of my grown life, um, uh, I very much feel kind of I skew to black because, you know, I'm. It's just I'm not reminded every day that I'm Korean, but I'm reminded every day that I'm black. You know, I just, you know, it's from how people look at me and, and expectations that are there and all. It's, I'm black. Um, I'm black who, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a black person who was born in Korea um, and the, the Korean culture is very much in me. Um, but it's not a, um, but I have to clarify this. It's not a rejection of the Korean culture. Like I love the Korean in me. Like every time I'm in K-Town, like I'm just cloud nine. You know, so yeah, yeah I, I feel very much um, connected to both sides of me. And it kind of depends on the day and the moment on how I feel in terms of that barometer of Korean and Black. Right. That's so interesting because in some ways, both of you were um, so rejected by the country because of race, right? Because of you were half Black. Until, until they found out I was married to a world-renowned foreign chef, you know? <laughs> and then there was, um, what's uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers? Uh, God, Heinz Ward. Heinz Ward. Yes, yeah. who I've met yeah, very much. Money changes much, everything. But <laughs> money changes everything. Accolades change everything. Yeah. In Suni, right? I mean, I'm sure she only got the accolades years later yeah. after she was popular as could be. But it's like, why does it have to be that? I, I hate that about, I actually, that really makes me sick. It's so fake. You know, but I have to say the majority of Korean people as a culture are not like that. It's I'm talking about that one percent that makes all the decisions as to who gets the money and who gets sponsored and this and that. They have their own ideas of what they want to feature, you know. Right. Right. So but overall, as a country, I mean, I am so proud to be Korean. I feel that Han when I land and I, I, I can see the mountains and I'm smelling the the sea and the pine trees at the same time. It's like, I don't know, makes me want to cry every time. But, yeah. you know. That's amazing, that's amazing. Yeah. But do you feel like there's something particular? I do feel like, um, maybe it's ignorance, maybe it's that especially among Korean Americans, um, older Korean Americans, there's a history of, you know, the LA riots and that's very kind of still in, the, in their memories um do you feel like there's a particularly kind of racist streak or kind of like an intolerance among koreans or korean americans that, that you oh yeah you yeah see? well um uh well, well put it this way like when i was a kid um uh and, and i'm not going to get this exactly correct but uh, uh because i don't i don't remember much of the language because it's been so long since i've used it but uh, I spoke Korean um, until I was basically nine years old, but I remember that song. And I, I know I butchered those words, but those words were basically, you know, the black monkey's buddy's red. That's what I heard. Oh, I didn't know that song. That's, that, that's, what, I, that's what I heard every day, all day. Oh, you know, no. In, in whether I was in the village, whether I was in Dongguchon, whether I was in Bukyang. Um, so, you know, but, but the thing is, you know, hey, um, number one, Number one, that's what, that's how kids are. Mm. <laughs> if you know, if, if you're that kid in the village with one arm, you gonna get talked about. You know what I mean? That's just the way you know. And 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 then you know, there's kind of um, you know, grown up, mature iterations of that. Um, a lot of kind of a lot of that what we feel um, in our lives. So there's there's a there's a part of kind of I know um, what I experience as. Um, Korean racism, which is really sharp and intense. Um, mm. uh, you know, yeah, it hurt then, didn't understand it. Um, but when I got adopted by a black family and got brought to the States and then saw all the other variations of racism, I just kind of chalked that up to human nature. And no, mm. when it comes to black and white, white racism here in the States, you know, not all racism has a legacy of, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, black and white slavery, um, mm -hmm. but it's just some of that. That's human nature, and you know, there's there's a there's a thing in which 
the majority, um, uh, which has the, you know, kind of which has the power because of the majority, where they think they got the power because of the majority and how they treat the minorities. So me, I've never really, you know, yeah, Koreans have a very kind of distinct type of racism that is kind of full of um, vitriol and judgment and, um, and, uh, and, and pain, um, you know, but, you know, a lot of other, you go to other parts of the world, you're going to get the same thing. And, you know, and it's like, you know, a lot of times I look at my, you know, uh, I look at Korean peeps that, that, that have that sort of feeling towards black folks. And I'm like, I'm like, you, you know, you kind of got what you got because you had a country. Black folks didn't have a country really, you know what I mean? So, um, so I, I guess all that to say, I take Korean racism, um, you know, number one is kind of human nature. Number two, it's a function of all the cultural stuff that's baked into the Korean culture in terms of the, 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 the definition of oneness and, and, and what it means to be Korean. And, um, and uh, you know, I just take it with a grain of salt, you know, because if you go to different parts of the world, you're gonna, you're gonna, see, you're gonna see the same stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you like, what is your response to like the Ajimas in 32nd Street who say, no, you're not Korean. Like, ha ha ha, you can't be Korean. Like, what do you normally, how yeah, do you respond? My, 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 my response is, um, uh, you know, my, my mother is, uh, um, I said, my mother's name is Pak Young Ja. Hmm. I grew up in Pupyong. My grandparents probably lived in Dongducheon. Wow. And then their eyes pop out of their head and they go, oh, okay, you are one of us. And then they and you get extra kimchi. Shit. <laughs> yeah, you know, That's and, and to me, and and that also says something else about the whole um, racism thing. I mean, kind of how it works. Um, you know, there's a, there's a, um, and, and I think which is kind of the linchpin of a lot of it. You know, if 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 someone would ask me, well, you know, that someone who's not black, and they go, well, you know, no, what do I do to kind of be a better ally? I'm like, just try to be open. And when you find a good opportunity to, to, um, to be cool with somebody black, because you know, we're, we're, we, especially those of us who live in New York, we have all kinds of opportunities to befriend somebody. Yeah. But oftentimes our biases kind of restrict us in terms of you know, who we befriend, right? Because we typically befriend those folks that are kind of more familiar to us in one way or the other. Um, mm -hmm. uh, hey, take a chance and befriend somebody black. And one of the first things that you're gonna find is they're a lot like you. It ain't, the, it ain't the folks that you hear about or see about on the news. There's just a lot, let me tell you this. So um, out of the family that I was adopted in, we had, uh, they had uh, Don Washington and Gwen Washington had four of their natural kids. Don, Donna, Darren, and Dwyn. Don's in Chicago. Donna is in Raleigh, Darren is in Indianapolis, Dwayne is in Alexandria where my parents live, Don Northwestern, Donna Northwestern, Darren Stanford MBA, Dwayne Northwestern. Nobody got a scholarship. So chances are, if you're on this call, they're very much like you. Chances are. And mm -hmm. if you gave them a chance, you'd go, well, damn. Black uh -huh. people are kind of like me too. Mm -hmm. So there, there's just a kind of an openness. And I know it's a, you know, it could be kind of an ask. It's a big ask. Just be open and just be kind of human and check yourself. That's the thing mm -hmm. I always kind of say, you know, listen, you come to any one of my parties, you're going to see 80 year olds, you'll see 20 year olds, <laughs> and you'll see every spectrum in between. And 80% of the crowd is probably going to be gay or LGBTQ in that category. Right. And 20% are just straight, you know? And chances are my, my best friends are going to come from the LGBTQ crowd. Right. Yeah. Just be Same open. Same here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 But beyond that, I feel like, you know, for, for a lot of us on this call, probably, you know, we're, we're younger, we're, younger generation, Korean American, Asian Americans, white Americans, black Americans, but it doesn't feel like it's enough just to be open 
right? Especially with all that's been going on, like it feels like we need to do something more. And I think that for Asian Americans and Korean Americans in particular, we just don't know where we fit in in the conversation. And I think it's we don't know how to insert ourselves. I think in some ways. Would you, you have any what? advice to us or any thoughts for in, in terms just of just jump in if you feel it and it feels strong. Just you know. For the Black Lives Matter, like I loved seeing the protests in Korea. I loved seeing, you know, Koreans in LA protesting. Um, I think it's awesome. You know, show up for us, we'll show up for you type of thing. Yeah. You know, I don't think you need to, to come in as a special category. I think that's a problem with everybody here. America, it's like, it doesn't have a culture of its own. It's all sub, you know, it's it's broken down into many different cultures which is beautiful and what makes this country great but at the same time i feel like um we're kind of stuck in those margins we put ourselves in korean americans african american i mean i'll, I'll just be thankful for the day where you can just say i'm a woman <laughs> you know <laughs> doesn't matter <laughs> right you, you know um my, my my thing is um i guess uh because I attribute a lot of kind of people's behavior um, to, uh, you know, kind of human nature. Um, I guess I have lower expectations for people really going out there and fighting our fight. I do. Um, I know, you know, there's this there's, there's protests in, um, uh, you know, in, in, in South Korea, in solidarity, um, you know, with Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, but it's kind of the thing now, but you know, I wonder what it's gonna look like in a year, right? Um, so I guess I don't I don't really have an ask at that level. Um I have an ask, um, really just kind of at the, you know, it's the personal relationship level. Um and and that ask is already kind of difficult because you know, a lot of this is just like, you know, why would you kind of, you know, most people don't want to put themselves in harm's way. You know, mm -hmm. and when you jump out there, especially as something that's as, um, you know, kind of publicized as Black Lives Matter and, you know, people have people have formed ideas on what that means. And all of a sudden, you know, um, you know, you, they see you in a march, you know, there's no telling what that can mean for your what implications, you know, that is for your job or your family or your community. You know, there's, there's no telling. So I, I guess I, I just don't have people. I, I don't have that expectation. But you know the 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 expectation that i have is just kind of on a personal level right and that personal level is just you know if if, if you want to if you are if you're down with a cause like i said i i just think that you kind of need to befriend somebody black mm. and and to and to and, and to have that person and have that person feel that there is support beyond the column of support that we've previously had, which is simply ourselves. And then that's even questionable. But to know that there's other people out there that's that's down for you, you know, that can have some serious ramifications for that individual. There's no telling what that individual can do as a result of that sense of broader support. Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, and I think that's very, very important because I, you know, I, I look at this kind of more at a, um, uh, I'm more interested in the micro level and the relationships, the personal relationships. Um, and, and I think that's just a, it's a very powerful thing that when someone outside of the previous um, scope of support, all of a sudden supports you and how energizing that can be. Just talk to somebody, befriend, befriend somebody, listen to somebody and start to understand that like we're all human beings and we're all kind of going through the same shit in many ways, just different kind of degrees and colors, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, there's an interesting, I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions that have been coming in and there's one from a single mother of a half black and half Korean. I see saw that. Yeah, and it, she was saying, I'm struggling with how to expose and teach him so he can be prepared for the real world as he becomes an adult. Do either of you have any advice for her? Gosh, well, well yeah. I mean, you go first, Mel. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, well, I, I would just say that, um, you know, because I know, I know several of these situations. 
Um, and one of these things is just kind of managing expectations. You have to understand that that child is at a, you know, that child, that, that person's childhood is, is nowhere near similar to our childhood, you know, previous generations. Um, and this is a, um, you know, to me, it's almost kind of, it's a fascinating time. It's a fascinating study and just, um, you know, kind of civilization and just, you know, human behaviors and, and, and all that. Um, but uh, have a expectation that there is going to be um, rage, um, not only as a black child now, because that person is black and there, and, and there's a kind of a funny thing with black. Um, there is a, there's a, um, a lot of people can be repulsed by black at the same time, be just completely drawn to black because black is so fascinating, you know? So not only is it rage, but there's also kind of conflict in that child's identity. And it's a lot to deal with. Um, and and um, be careful of, you know, just kind of letting that um, kid do what they do. Um, you know, there might be an optimal balance of um, talking to, showing, understanding, being a parent, putting the foot down, um, keeping them out of harm's way, um, and also kind of letting them be free um, and experience um, this kind of moment of time uh, um, in, in, in our history. Um, so my short answer is, I don't know. Um, I don't know, but it's hard. But um, to the parent, not only be open, but also be a parent. You know, yeah. which means that you're not trying to be your kid's friend. Yeah. Well, I know what your parenting style is. <laughs> <laughs> you'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so I, I have uh, my daughter, Chloe, who is... Um, She's everything, really, literally. Um, so I remember in fourth grade, she came home and she said, Mom, am I African? And my Korean mom said, no, you're not. Like, it was the <laughs> worst thing in the world. And I was like, excuse me. I was like, Chloe, let's talk about this in the kitchen. So I said, if anybody asks you what you are, just tell them you're the world. I mean, you're going to name every continent, you know? And she's like, oh, yeah. So then after that, I think... Um, just, I would say to you as a mom of a mixed child, I think it's important, very important for kids to grow up with um, examples of both cultures, even if it's not an immediate um, family member, you know, it could be a communal thing. It could be recognizing holidays, watching programs. I mean, I feel like uh, children, they go through, we all have been through this age, especially middle school. I think it starts where you're finding out who you are, trying to figure out who you are. And it's all the more difficult, I think, sometimes, depending on representation or lack of representation in your um, community, you know, that could be quite confusing at times, as it was for me. But I think if you're able to bring that and, and bring those cultural references home, maybe have them go visit family they wouldn't normally visit. You know, I, I've had Chloe go down south and visit, you know, my African-American side of the family. And she's also been to France. And she's also been to Korea, you know. So she's experienced everything and she's comfortable everywhere, I think, as a result of that. And, you know, she's got more of a uh, respect for other people's cultures or even food that she doesn't necessarily like or smells or a language. Like, she's got a sensitivity, you know, because her grandmother speaks broken English and you know, I mean, it's just the whole gamut. So I think exposure is the most important thing and teach them to love themselves, you know, and they'll see that through you. They'll learn how to love themselves the way you love yourself. Yeah. I feel like both of you are such um, amazing examples of staying hopeful and positive and passionate and also creating um, as chefs and as artists. Like I, I do feel like you've kind of channeled the, the, the experiences that you've had um, to something so positive. Um, how do you remain passionate and hopeful, especially during this time where, you know, if I feel like our country is so, um, you know, burdened by this long history of racism that we just can't seem to break out of? 
<laughs> well, um, for me, it's been cooking. That always feeds my soul. Uh, I started, I was gung ho about this YouTube channel. I did like four videos and then I'm like, wait a minute. You know, I'm trying to churn one out every week. The editing, forget it. So that just kind of went to the wayside. But I've been having a lot of fun. I've been um, honing my craft, so to speak, using different techniques, learning other foods, actually. I'm really into Thai food right now. So, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to mix it with the Korean. A little soul food, you know? <laughs> isn't Jean George, isn't that his expertise in some ways as well? Yeah, well, I mean, yes, <laughs> he's got his thing. I've got mine, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's more European, his um, take on things. Um, and it's funny because every time I have family from Korea come into town, you know, I'm trying to wine and dine them at all the restaurants. And my, my biological cousin, my, my Korean uncle's youngest son is a sous chef at Perry Street, one of JG's restaurants. Um, and he spoke no English when he came here, but he learned in the kitchen. So he's amazing. Um, so I usually try and wine and dine my family the first few days they're there. And they always have a stomach ache. So I end up having to make Korean food at home. Kimchi chige. They're, they're always digging in the fridge for kimchi. And then after that, we don't go out at all. <laughs> so it's quite funny. Yeah. 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 You know, me, um, I guess I, I, I stay kind of encouraged because, uh, um, you know, w one of the most important things to me in my life is um, my artistry, you know, and, um, and, and, and with my artistry, um, uh, and, and artistry comes in many, many ways, but um, I don't have a problem expressing myself. And, and, and I think um, as an artist, uh, I think it's times like these that, you know, we oftentimes feel the pressure to really, really express ourselves. Um, and, and I think I think art does something to the world that kind of, you know, kind of pushes the pendulum back to the side of good, you know? And, um, you know, it's not going to stay on, on on the dark side forever, and um, I think um, artists and and just people with, um, you know, with a with a sense of real direction in their hearts, they kind of step up during times like these. You know, um, uh, I'm hoping that uh, people step up in a serious way. Um, you know, but I know I know a lot of people who are doing something really really positive to push. Um, like I said, that pendulum back to the other side. Mm. Yeah. Yep. yeah, for sure. And support each other. Yeah. You know, support every little thing. That's what I do. I hear a little cause, I do what I can. Th that's my philosophy. Do what you can when you can. And yeah. I think that goes across the board, not only in these times, race relations, just being a human being, do what you can when you can. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like that's like a great spot to end. I don't know if you wanted to add anything else, Marja and Milton. Um, well, I'm, you know, I just want to thank you for even thinking of me to have me on this panel, really. Um, you guys are just so supportive and send me so much love. I really appreciate it. You guys are wonderful. I hope we do something again in person. Definitely a K-Town situation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And karaoke when we can get back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I gotta say the same thing. You know, um, you know. Definitely, thanks to um, KCS and the associate board, um, and uh, I also know that you know, for people who are kind of on the on on the outside looking in on situations like these, um, you know, in which it's not when you you in which you might think that it's not necessarily your fight, but I don't know. I, I I don't. I think you know. It's not like I was. You know, I was alive a hundred years ago, um, and I don't know how it was back, back in the days when you know similar situations might have arose. But it just seems like this, we, we're just kind of at a, um, at a at a at a point in history that's just unprecedented. And um, if you choose to just to kind of stay on the stay on the sideline because. You don't think this is your fight? Chances are you're gonna be wrong, and chances are you know you, you're. Um, it will you're be. Either, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, there ain't nothing wrong with a little fight in your life. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah, I agree. I, I I think, you know, people who turned a blind eye to racism done to other people, I mean, if it's gonna happen to it, it's just like the Nazis. I mean, they went through everybody. Come on, people, this is happening. I mean This is how it happens. You know. Yeah. This is how it happens. It starts with the most marginalized people. Right. And then everybody else who's different. So yeah. Do you think yeah. there's anything like um, in particular that like Asian Americans can add to this conversation? And I think we're all just, we want to be part of that fight and we want to not just stand on the sidelines. That is not what most of us, I think, on this call want to do. But I think we end up there because we're not, we're just not sure how to plunge in, <laughs> um, you know. especially in terms of like, not just in terms of personal relationships, but maybe on a, on a slightly broader scale. Hmm. You know what I've always thought was was lacking in terms of just information about Korea in general is that Koreans really don't talk about their history so much outside of Korea. And we have a lot of pain and slavery. I mean, le legit slavery. And, you know, I mean, maybe the fear with uh, Asian Americans is that they're not, they feel like maybe they don't have a... Um, a place to have a voice because maybe they haven't gone through the same time, but you guys have. I mean, people need to know Korean history as well. It's not just LG and Samsung in the last, you know, however many years it's been. I mean, that's fabulous, of course. When a country, you know, pulls together, everybody gets up together. But I mean, the dirty details need, your pain needs to come out, you know, to be more relevant in the world. And Talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. I always, I try to talk about it, especially when I am, um, you know, in relation to my African-American side. I'm like, Korean people are the sole people of Asia in right. so many ways, <laughs> Right. you know? Yeah. Right, I, I, I agree with that. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a chapter in, in the book that, that, that I'm still writing. And by the way, I don't think it's going to be 2021 when it drops, no. but uh, <laughs> I don't think so. But, but, um, but, but the chapter is, uh, um, is entitled uh, Church and Chicken. And, um, and it's about, you know, it, it, it's really about the, the commonalities of, of Black folks and Koreans. Um, <laughs> You know, like you can go to Korea and go to church and you'd swear it was a hundred black folks up there singing in that choir. That's true. Like you that is swear. True. Did you, know, you see those four guys in the car with that YouTube channel? I mean, they're so seen soulful. That yet. Oh, I gotta send you the link. I'm, yeah, send that to me. <laughs> but 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 she the thing send it is, to though, all of us. <laughs> yeah. You know, no. but 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 the thing is it's it's um you know, a, a, a lot of the black condition is is like it, it, a lot of it is so environmental in terms of the repression, the boot on the neck, mm -hmm. um, and Koreans know something about that repression too. They know a little something about that Han, you know, and 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 because of it, you know, uh, it forges a people that are uh, not only resilient um, but also creative in so many ways. And um, deeply emotional, yeah. And deeply emotional. Like, I don't, you know, it's, it's you know, co Korean folks will, you know, like I, I've experienced a lot of Korean folks, you know, upon meeting them and having having a couple drinks, it only takes like two drinks. They're, you know, somebody's <laughs> crying. <laughs> somebody's crying, somebody crying on my shoulder. You know, you know and I'm like, I'm like, come on dog, I don't, I don't really know you. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> man, we're cool, man, but you know, you know, get off me. Um, you know, but, but, but the thing is, yeah, we, we are emotional because, you know, when you've been, when you've been held down in such a way, um, it's hard not to be connected to your heart in that way. It's just hard, you know? Yeah. Um, and it's hard not to, you know, to, to, to feel some kind of way about the suffering that other people have, uh, other people experience, you know, and sometimes, sometimes you just gotta, you know, you, you gotta know, you know, kind of going back to the question of like, you know, what to do, you know, uh, like I said, I don't really have expectations of people, you know, going out doing a whole lot of fighting for long for the cause of black folks, um, you know, but you know, I'll tell you what, you know, next time you're in a room and somebody's talking shit about black folks, speak up. Mm -hmm. Say something. 
you know? And, you know, do so with grace. Do so in a way that you don't lose your job or lose the account, um, you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> but but the thing is to stand yeah. up for stand up for black folks is like standing up for women. It's standing up yeah. for all sorts of like, you know, I remember when I was a kid, you know, coming from what I came from to to be told every day that I was worthless. It was impossible for me to be on a playground in the in the in the fifth grade and some kid is pushing on another kid because they're bigger. Mm. It was impossible. I didn't know that kid that was getting pushed around from a can of paint, but I'm standing up because I know what right. that feels like. Yeah. And yeah, you know, I could have got jumped or beat up and all that, you know, but my body just wouldn't allow me to let that injustice happen. Yeah. It goes against everything that I stand for. It goes against that. That would mean me turning my back on myself. I'm not doing it. So I just think that, you know, you know, you got to think about it. You know, it's a, you know, it's a difficult thing. It's a very, very difficult, nuanced thing. Very, very complicated, you know, but when you can, you know, you might just say something, boom, the doors open to the elevator and you walk out. Right. But, you know, excuse my French, but that motherfucker needs to know that they did something wrong. Yeah. And everybody mm -hmm. around them ain't down for it. And yeah. to me, right. that is a, and, and enough people start to do that, culture can start to shift in a serious yes. way, in a meaningful way. Not just, mm -hmm. hey, hey, I'm down, but I still harbor these feelings against Black folks. And, but I'm, st I'm trying to look kind of cool and, you know, be down for the cause because it's hard to change someone's heart. But, like, listen to your heart, for real. Yeah. 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 That is really powerful. And I think that you're, you're so right, Milton. Like, I think that sense of empathy that, um, you know, that, that we as Koreans and Asians have suffered as well, different kind of historical points and different kinds yeah. of suffering, but that that is something that um, we can empathize with and allow that to help us speak up in those type of situations. I think it's, yes. it's such a good lesson for all of us and not be scared because we're the minority, we're the model minorities or we're, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. Asian Americans in that way. So we thank you so much for, for your time tonight. I feel like we could have Aww. talked for another like 30 minutes and um, definitely a, a couple of shots would have really helped, I think. really <laughs> 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 flowing. Um, but thank you. I really appreciate your time. Um, thank you. And hope you can, we can do this again. Uh, maybe definitely. when you come out, Milton, we'll have you thank back. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. I think I'm going to pass it on to, is it back to Hannah? Yes. Great. Um, yes, thank you again so much, Milton and Marja. There were too many good quotables, and I'm just like so eager to look back on the, on the chat as well. Um, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us, and um, totally would love to do a K-Town hang when all this is over. So, all right. um, yeah, we'll definitely love to do yes. that. Yes, <laughs> nothing but a word. <laughs> um, I'd like to just quickly introduce our sponsors for this event. Um, so we as an associate board, we try to use our platform to also support small businesses. Um, for this particular event, we are so proud to have partnered with a Korean and a black owned business. Uh, so first we have Nuna Noodles. Nuna Noodles is a mother-daughter Korean-American owned business. They're located in New York City Koreatown's food gallery on West 32nd Street. Um, all attendees tonight will be able to get a free side dish with any um, purchase of noodles. So please just show your Eventbrite ticket in person and the, um, the deal is good until this Friday. So we just want to thank Nuna Great. Noodles for, for partnering with us. Uh, next, we yeah. Uh, next, we have the Whistlethorn. Uh, the Whistlethorn is um, a black and female-owned business. They're based in Brooklyn. 
Um, the whistling, excuse me, the whistling thorn um, is designed, their products are designed to help city dwellers give their skin enough of what it needs to maintain balance in harsh urban environments. The line contains all natural aromatic oils and fragrances uh, with the safest synthetics used to provide stability. And all the attendees here can use the code BK Voices for 15% off their inventory. Um, so this deal will also be good through August 2nd. Um, so thank you again, Whistling Thorn, for, for partnering with us on this event. Thank All you. Right. Uh, and yeah, uh, and finally, please follow. Um, uh, there's so many handles listed here, but we've got uh, KCS listed. We've got the Associate Board um, Instagram listed, Marja, Milton's, uh, Nunas, and Whistling Thorn. So please um, give us a follow, and, and uh, we hope to see you at more of these events, hopefully to keep the conversation going. And uh, as always, please provide you know, your comments, your feedback. We'd love to always have this conversation even outside of this forum. So thank you everyone for attending tonight. And thank you so much again, Marja and Milton. Yeah, um, thank you. This is our amazing. pleasure, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Great. All right, guys, bye-bye. Okay, Good night. be well, bye. Be well. See you in K-Town. <laughs>